All right, let's give us a minute to spool up. Here we go. Does Twitch like me? Can we keep going? Come on, Twitch. Come on, Twitch. And we're back. Fantastic. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We're jumping in. I'll give it about a minute so people can log in. I feel like time moves faster when I teach online. I don't know why. Probably because I'm just talking to myself. Hmm. That might be it. All right, folks. We're going to get to the end. Lots of battle scenes now. Um... And if you're curious what all these fighters look like, by the way, you now have wonderfully explicit graphics. So, and if you're like, Professor, these sure look like samurai, you're right. They're very much, they're the early cousins of what eventually become the modern Japanese samurai. Not quite there yet. Uh, there's still some definitely fudge between nobility and fighters, right? It's just being noble or non-noble, and then fighter or non-fighter. We don't actually have samurai as a class yet. Just more like traditional warriors. No reason a noble can't fight, basically, if he's good at it. All right, so. Opening that, great. Opening PowerPoint, great. All right, let's keep going. All right, now we have the turn. They retook the capital. That's where we left off, right? And some of the sad stories and the, the Hay K's rousing speeches. Um, we get to eight, and eight five is his cloistered eminence appoints a supreme commander. I'll let it sit for a second. So Yoritomo, the dad, in Kamakura, receives from the cloistered emperor decree appointing him supreme commander of the imperial forces. Wow. Supreme commander. Man, I wonder what the new Japanese for that is. Hmm. But so now the Minamoto, a.k.a. the Genji, have been promoted to officially imperial command and this is an 18 to show you how fast time can move in this story uh, this is 1183 so they actually fought for almost two years already so a couple of chapters is two years of fighting or not fighting now when I say not fighting because let's be honest moving by land isn't as fast as you think and you basically don't, don't fight every season because that's silly you mostly fight uh, around harvest. That's the Japanese traditional fighting season. Although you could fight other times, it's just not as convenient. Alright, so we get this, there's a lot in here about how they receive the emissary, which it just demonstrates Yoritomo and the Genji are very respectful of the Emperor. I'm sure he appreciates it. Alright, now we get into some of the fighting. Where you get some, there's a lot of fighting that I'm kind of skipping over. Um, so for example, this the death of Senno, it happens during the Battle of Mizushima where the Genji fight the Minamoto. Now, this one's interesting in the way... Because then we get some interesting death... How would I say it? We get an interesting death sequence. That's what I would call this one. So we get Senno O and his death sequence. Uh, this is basically a, one of the generals, Kiso and Senno O, are basically running after being defeated. And I'm pretty sure they're both. I just read this today and it actually confused me again. I'm pretty sure they're both. Let's see. Hey, okay, but they might actually be Genji. Let me see this. No, 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 I was right. So Sen no o and uh, Kiso, these are two commanders of this army that get defeated in 8-7. We get an interesting state of these people. So, oh yeah, so Sen no o gets captured by the Heike, and then he breaks away. Let me find this out. Beep, boop, boop, beep, beep, boop, doo, 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 doo. So this guy's a prisoner. He manages to finagle his way out of being captured. And then while escaping, this guy's a pretty badass. He escapes. And then he, in a random province, manages to raise several hundred people and build a fort before they can come get him. And then 
so he, he got away again, and then he manages to fight his way off several times. This guy's a pretty badass. Now, why, why do you get captured and live? Well, if you, were, if you were badass enough, or useful enough, or famous enough, or prestigious enough, they capture you instead of killing you. This is a very interesting kind of formulation. Let me find this. We get the picture from his chapter. Now, interesting enough, the chapter is called His Death. This is not about his death. Uh, this instead is a guy who tries to capture him as he's running. This is after already escaping and then fighting back again. He then runs again. Here, I'm looking up here. Let's see. So he's running away again, and then this guy, Narizumi, tries to capture him. Uh, Senno just drowns him in a river and steals his horse. That's how bamf this guy is. This guy just does what he wants. Now, he, he's basically almost escaping again. Now, this is funny. So part of his rebellion actually became his son. Now, him and his son and a couple guys are trying to make it away. And this is one reason I picked this chapter. This is Senno O and his son. They're fleeing, but his son is overweight and fat. His name's Kotaro Muneasu. And then they're fleeing, and the dad is on horseback, and this fat kid's on foot. The fat kid, they eventually, him and one retainer, get away from the fat kid, and then thinking about it, where's the thought process here? The father left him behind and fled another mile. Then he, his, oh, then he and his man met. Normally, when I fight an enemy in the thousands, he said, the world seems bright around me. But now everything ahead seems dark. Perhaps it's because I abandoned Kotaro. That's his son. Even if I were to live and serve the Heike again, my fellows might well say, that Kaneyasu, over 60, doesn't have many years left. Can those years really have met so much that he abandoned his only son to flee? So yeah, Senoyo was captured by the Genji, but he's a Heike. So what happens? He turns around, and his, oh, his advisor says this. He's just one of his random men. That is exactly why I urge you to meet your fate with him, the man replied. Sir, please turn back. Then I will. And he turns back and goes back to his son. And this is funny. He finds his son lying there, with terribly swollen feet. This is his fat son. And he says, quote, I came back to die fighting with you, since you couldn't keep up, all right? Tears streamed down his son's cheeks. I am so hopeless, he answered, that I should have killed myself, and now you too, because of me, at any moment will face death, which makes me guilty, it seems to me, of foul crime of patricide. Turn back, flee, there is no time to lose. No, said his father, my mind is made up. And they waited. And now Imai Kanehira, a famous guy, is coming down on him and his son with 50 riders. Uh, and this is where you get the battle sequence. This is, this is pretty something. Sen no -o shot his last arrows. Seven or eight of them rapidly. Five or six riders fell stricken. Dead or not, there is no telling. Drew his sword. Beheaded his son. And charged into the enemy, slashing at every man around him. They answered with many blows until at last they struck him down. While his man's valor rivaled his lord's, Weakened by the grievous wounds, he failed to kill himself as he wished. Instead was taken prisoner. Only that day later he died. They hung the heads of all three men. And then Lord Kiso inspected them. Ah, he sighed. These were true warriors, each worthy to face a thousand. What a shame I could not spare them. <laughs> so welcome, welcome to a hero, right? He goes back to fight for his son, but instead of... You know, his son's on the ground, he cuts his head off and fights to the death, gets captured, and then dies. Welcome to how these battles go. Again, why would I include this one? It's interesting emotional quality. That's why I say I'll include this one. But it's a very, it kind of shows character of a lot of these people, and what they consider to be a good fighter. All right, and as normal, just ask me questions as we're in the in the stream. I'll be happy to interrupt myself. Uh, I, I do want to get to the end, though, so if I seem like I'm rushing, that's probably why. All right, uh, book nine, and again, oh, this is the fun picture, yeah. This picture is actually from part of the story, so we'll talk about this. So, uh, the death of Kiso. So the guy we just heard about who captured Senno, the Genji commander, now he gets his, this, this is a very, you get to learn a lot of the back and forth of this story. So we're now in book nine, and then we get the death of Kiso. So this is the guy who fought earlier. Now we learned something interesting about Lord Kiso, who's Genji. Uh, he brought back for him with him from Shinano two beauties, Tomoe and Yamabuki. Yamabuki was unwell and stayed in the capital. With her lovely white skin and long hair, Tomoe had enchanting looks, an archer of rare strength, a powerful warrior. On foot and on horseback, a swordsman 
to face any demon or god. She was a fighter to stand alone against a thousand. She would ride the wildest horse down the steepest slope. In battle, Kiso clad her in the finest armor, equipped her with a sword and a mighty bow, and charged her with the attack on the opposing commander. She won such repeated glory that none could stand beside her. And that is why, when so many had already fallen, cut down in their flight, Tomoe remained among the last seven. Oh, and spoiler, Book 9 has another big fight. And this time, and this is a uh, 9-3, it's called Battle Besides the River, Kiso now loses, basically. Oh, and somebody asked me, is Sen no Oz considered a happy ending? Yes, that would have been considered a heroic, good ending for a defeated warrior. And actually, in this one, we get to see the attempt at a slightly better one. Although, I would argue, of the two, Kiso does not die as well. So now Kiso's defeated, who was previously victorious. Now he's running away. And we just got to learn about one of his women warriors, by the way. So if you want to look up Tomoe again, she comes back, don't worry. So now they're fleeing, basically, because they lost. And their their other friend who killed uh, the last guy we talked about, Imai Kanehira, is back. And he also is starting to lose, and they're retreating together. So Kiso and Kanehira are retreating And they basically meet up, and now he says, Then the bond between us still holds. The enemy is scattered. This is on uh, 464. And driven them into the woods. They must be somewhere nearby. So they raise their banner. They get some They get some men to show up. They're fighting 6,000 against 600. And we get a little description of their clothes. And now they're being chased by a lot of people. And he says, You've long heard tell of me, the man from Kiso. Now with your eyes behold the chief of the left equerry, also the governor of Io, famed Asahi, Asashi Shogun Minamoto Yoshitaka. And you and Ichiro and Kiro from Kai, hear me. We are worthy opponents, you and I. Take my head and show it to Yoritomo. So they're fighting now. And... Yep, they, so Kiso gets surrounded with a mass of men. And let's see. And we get this huge fighting where basically they go from 6,000 against 500. They slowly lose more men. Now, uh, I read this chapter. It's a great one. But I want to point out some of the interesting parts. So, for example, here. the last They went from 300 again back down to 5. The last remnant band of 5 included Tomoe. Lord Kiso said to her, Go, woman. Go quickly anywhere, far away. For myself, I shall die in battle. Or, if wounded, take my own life. It must not be said that at the end I had a woman with me. She still did not go, but pressing, he kept pressing her until at last she reflected. All I want is a worthy opponent. So I, he can watch me fight my last fight. That's Tomoe, the woman. And then, and then while she waited... A guy shows up, his name's Onda no Hachiro Moroshige, a man from Musashi, famed for his strength. Rode up with thirty men. Tomoe charged, caught him in an iron grip, forced his head down on her pommel, kept it pinned there, twisted it around, cut it off, tossed it away. So she didn't kill him. Like, she killed him. But she didn't just kill him, right? She fought him, grabbed him, while they're both riding horses. <laughs> Put his head in between her lap, right, the pommel of your saddle. Cut his head off. And this is the best part, ready? Uh, she then abandoned her arms and armor and fled towards the east. <laughs> so she killed her last lord and then just ghosts. Because she's a woman, right? Nobody will ever know who she was. So she disappeared again. Uh, and then finally, we're down to Imai and Kiso, the last two guys. And actually, I'm looking up one thing really quick. I'm pretty sure these guys are Heike, actually. Uh, Kanehira. Nope. I have my... There's so many names, even it gets me sometimes. Do, 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 do. Is he not famous enough to get his own entry? Come on. Yoshinaka. Yoshinaka. 
Oh yeah, so Kiso is Minamoto, for sure. So yeah, this guy does his final fight. He's uh, Kiso Minamoto. He is one of them, but they call him Kiso, not a Genji. So this woman, who's badass, she does her last fight, kills a guy, gets away. Then we get to learn how Imai and Kiso die. And Imai, who he says to him, uh, Kiso's getting tired, basically. He still, there's still life left in you, and your horse is not yet winded. Why should mere armor weigh heavily on you? Perhaps because losing all your men made you a coward. There is only one of me, I know, but think of me as a thousand. I have seven or eight arrows left. I will cover you for a while. Look over there, a pine, one, pine wood of Awazu. Go among the pines and take your life. They were urging their horses away when a new band of fifty appeared. Go among the pines, lord, said Imai. I will keep them off. I should have faced the fate in the capital itself, Kiso replied. But I fled the way here to die with you. I want us to die together, not apart. He brought his horse beside Imai and prepared to change. And then they have this fight. And then Imai basically fights them all off. And Kiso, too late, runs for the pine wood to kill himself. Now, why would he want to do this? Because... Um, my brain's breaking. Basically, he wants to not be killed by some random guy. So the, if, if I'm a random guy in this warfare, if you haven't figured it out yet, I get status for killing you. So it, a good lord will basically kill himself if he can, to save himself the honor. So I was looking something up. This guy might be more confusing than I thought. I think Kiso might actually be a Minamoto traitor. Hmm. That's why it's confusing. Yeah, yeah. So he is a Heike, but he's a, he's a Genji fighting for the Heike, which makes it way more confusing. So, because he's shouting threats at Yoritomo's men. So, wow. Super confusing. But uh, welcome to the confusion. I'm going to have to dig down on this later. But again, why is this one cool? Because he's trying to kill himself to, like, have his honor. Now, what ends up happening, um, he hesitates too long. And then gets shot in the neck and dies. And then they capture him and they're super excited. And, right, if you're a random guy and you kill the one of the biggest lords, that's a crappy ending. And that, the reason I mention both of these is because you get to see both the happy, a.k.a. Uh, Sanoo, right? He gets to die a good death. Right? He dies, even though he gets captured, he dies fighting well. But then we get this lord who dies badly. He basically just gets shot in the back of the neck. And uh, that's it. It's not very, it's not very pleasing. It's actually pretty depressing. I'm pretty sure Kanehira. Now I really want to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I'm definitely looking at these family trees. There's always a couple people that sneak through my memory box. And I literally read this today. Hmm. Because not everybody's in the family tree. So I have to just see. Nope, he's not. Okay, I'm going to leave these two alone. It sure seems like they're Heike. Uh, from all the things. But Death of Kiso, basically a bad death. Alright, now we get a couple other stories. So next one, we get the double. Yeah, here we go. We, we start to get the... Where did I put my double death? Here we go. The Death of Kiso. 11. Yeah, 11 and 12. So 11 and 12, we now get more battles, right? So the double attack is where we start to get some of the serious fights. Um, and they're sieging a fortress. This time, the Genji are attacking a Heike fortress. And again, they've lost the capital, right? So the Heike are still trying to come back. And uh, this one, we get a very... You just start to get like a full... This is where you're like your first full-scale battle. And you get the challenges, you get the poetry... But the interesting part is part 12, which is this picture here. The charge down the he Hiodori Ravine. Basically, these guys goat the city. What I mean is, uh, they sneak around behind this, this, fortifica this fortified location, and they almost march 3,000 horses down a sheer cliff. And defeat them. So there's a lot, there's a lot of, uh, I'm not going to say hijinks. I'll say... 
uh, events. And this is the going down the cliff. Here's the actual picture from your book, where the Genji pour down the Hidadori feet and set fire to the Heike camp. So there's a lot of very heroic fights here, too. Uh, I, I, I'd love to explain them more, but just the pure limitation of time makes it quite hard. And let's see. And now, okay, so the Heike are losing, obviously, right? There's some back and forth, but like this is, we start to get some big battles and big defeats. So chapter 9... We start to lose a lot of the kids in the family. So we now lose Taranori, um, a major Heike death. And I'm pretty sure this is one of the sons of Shigemori, just from the name. This is the nice part, anyway. They used to have very nice naming conventions. Let's see. Taranori. Nope, he's one of them, but I cannot find his dad to save my life. Why not? Oh, obviously. He's one of Kiyomori's brothers. So here we go. So he's Kiyomori's uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth brother. So we start to get deaths, and so the, the this is one of the patriarchs of the family getting wiped out. So the, um, this one, the death of Tadanori. We have Tadanori, the governor of Satsuma, command of the West Heike Force. He wore armor, he was powerful... And this one is interesting. He's not a famous fighter, but again, we this is right after another lost battle. Uh, and this is actually right after that big rout. This one. The, the, the city gets destroyed. And this guy tries to escape. He actually tries to pretend to be a Genji. And then they kill him, and this is the sad part. How do they identify his body? Well, spoiler, right? One reason they identified themselves during battle by yelling out their names is, how do you know people's faces? They didn't have photos, right? Unless you knew people... You didn't know who you were killing. So somebody actually beats him in a battle, cuts his head off, because he's trying to lie. What was it? He tries to lie his way out of this hugely lost battle. So uh, he gets cap he gets captured. Now this is what makes him interesting. Tadanori. He said he knew the end was coming. He says, leave me a moment. I wish to call the name ten times. He grips the guy about to kill him, shoves him a bow length away, turns the face west, calls the name of the Amida ten times, ended, quote, you who illuminate the worlds, you gather to all without fail, all sentient beings call your name. At the very instant, Okabe, the guy who's about to kill him, from behind struck off his head. He knew he had killed the commander, but not who the commander was. He then read a strip of paper attached to the slain man's quiver. It bore a poem on the topic, quote, Blossoms of the Wayside Inn, and this is the poem, Nightfall on the road, and should one seek lodging. Beneath a cherry tree, the blossoms themselves that night might prove a most gracious host. And it's signed Tadanori. He knew he had won his prize. He impaled the head on the sword and announced he killed him. Both sides, hearing these words, were struck with pity. Alas, they cried, for a gentleman so accomplished in both poetry and war, this great commander will be missed. So for sure, there's this mood of mutual respect still, right? Like, a lot of these people grew up together. They knew each other. Uh, next one, one of the other brothers, Shigehara, actually I think he's one of the grandsons, gets captured alive, and he'll get his own sub-story, and we're going to come back to him. But again, not everybody just gets outright killed. Depends on the person. So, let's see. Shigehara is the son of Kiyomori. He's the one, two... Three, four, five. Fifth brother of Kiyomori's son. So he gets captured. That's not good. So now we get more of these stories. Uh, book 10. So the Heike are starting to lose. And we're starting to get ocean pictures. And if you don't know why this is fortuitous, you will soon. Don't worry. Okay. Now Shigehara, the reason we mentioned him getting captured, one of the Heike... He gets taken back to the capital as a captured person. And we have this one, the gentlewoman in the palace. Um, basically, people the, 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 the Genji are really sweet to him. Now, what, what's why are they keeping him alive? Uh, spoiler, he's the guy who was in charge of the army that burned Nara to the ground. So the Nara monks want his head. And the city of Nara wouldn't mind uh, hanging him too. 
But then we get to learn Lord Shigehara's character. So he gets embarrassed a bunch, and then he goes to the capital, and he impresses people, especially um, the people who's watching him. I'm trying to figure out who they made watch him. Let's see. One of the Genji. <laughs> Oh, and they keep him alive too, trying to negotiate with his brother. Doesn't work, by the way. So yeah, so the guy that watches him isn't that important, but he impresses him, and he gets to, like, we get to see kind of, he gets to interface with a woman he was in love with. That's why it's called the Gentlewoman in the Palace. Uh, we get to see a bit of his character. He writes a bunch of poetry. And then we get the precepts, a.k.a. he tries to take, um, where is this? He tries to take Buddhist office. I say try because they don't actually let him do it because the monks are going to want it. Then you know the monks want to pass at him. Now, interestingly, we get a guy called Honan, who's this guy here, who is a famous founder of uh, an exclusive kind of Pure Land Buddhism, who is an old friend who he invites, and again they let him come, which is impressive. Um, and they let him come, and he offers to, like, become a monk, and they don't know. And then this guy explains the basics of Buddhist precepts to him. Let me give you some of this conversation. Um, so he asks, and they say, I have no objection to this monk fought coming. And then they're the old friend. So Honan shows up to Shigehira, and then we have a long little thing here. He says, being taken prisoner has allowed me to see you once again. What can I do to achieve salvation in life to come? When I was the man I used to be, official duty blotted out all else. The business of government kept me tied. An abyss of conceit and arrogance yawned in me. I gave, never gave a thought to the future salvation or to perdition. Then the fortunes of my house sank low. The world lapsed into chaos. And after that, there was nothing for me but a battle here, a skirmish there. All I ever thought was killing or evading death. Preoccupation so evil to stifle every good. And then he talks about his worst sin, right? Then came the great fire of Nara. No one does not question an order from the sovereign or from the highest military authority. The monks were behaving outrageously. I went down there to quell. The next thing, I knew the temples had burned, but certainly not because I have ever meant them to. The truth is, I could do nothing to stop it. And then looking back over my whole life, I'm skipping a little bit. This is on uh, 534, if you're curious. Looking back over my whole life, all my deeds, I see bad karma, soaring higher than Mount Sumeru, and do not not a scrap of sort of good of my life is to end so wasted. There is no doubt fire, blood, and the sword loom before me in the hereafter. Please, your reverence, I beg you, show this sinner your compassion some way towards salvation. Now this is this is where we get like how, uh, and this is where we learn a little bit more about Pure Land Buddhism too, which makes it useful for analytics. The saintly Ho Honan dissolved in tears and remained a moment speechless. End quote. No sorrow, he said, could adequately mourn so sad a return. From a possession of a human body always exceedingly rare to those dire three realms. But if only you will now shun this polluted world and aspire to the pure land, if only you will renounce evil and arouse a longing for good, then the Buddhas of the past, present, and future will surely rejoice. Now there are many paths to release, but the later days of the law, when minds are polluted and confused, the best of all is calling the name. Only aspire to the ninth level of the paradise and confine practice to the six sacred syllables. And this is saying the, the name of the Anima Buddha, which is Namu Amida Bu. And it's, you just say that. And if you believe it hard enough, you make it. And he says, uh, absolutely anyone, however foolish and benighted, can find their way if they call the name. And then he goes on to explain more of the theology, if you're curious, here on uh, 535. But basically says, you can make it. And out of gratitude, Shigehara gives him an imperial gift from China that his dad had. And he gives it to the monk and says, please keep forever and pray for me. So we start, we start to learn that like not all the Heike are bad guys. Still got it. They still took reward, though. So they're going to still have to you know take consequences. And then we get another story. This is actually the same guy. They actually, uh, in Yoritomo, back in Kamikura, they they keep moving. Oh man, I, I, I'm blanking. How did I blank on his name? 
they keep moving Shigehira, this guy who's captured, and now he goes all the way to meet Yoritomo, and he impresses Yoritomo too. Um, and he and Yoritomo wants him to be taken care of, so he asks, he takes a bath. You're like, what? Baths, if you don't know about Japan, 800 years ago, and now they're considered great. And then uh, two ladies give him the bath, because it's considered less offensive, and he makes friends with this girl called, this is the name of the chapter, Senju no Mae. So these two women bathe him, but this is Senju no Mae. And they become friends, and then they sing music together for a whole night. Apparently, Shigehara is an amazing musician. And he's a Biwa musician and a singer. And basically, everybody listens. And it's only with her and a couple of, of the kids, the Genji kids. Oh, that's the wrong one. A couple of the Genji kids and Senju and... And our friend here are all singing together. Where's his name? Yeah, Shigehara. So they're all singing together. Where did I put that picture? Doot, doot, doot. I lost my good picture, man. Here we go. Yeah, we'll reopen it. Yeah, so Shigehara and Senju and a couple of, of the Genji boys are all singing together. And it's so touching, it even gets... Yoritomo to say, well, he certainly is cultivated. We may never again hear such a touch of the biwa or such a roe singing. And what happens? Well, Senju no Mae, that night, seems to have started on her path towards melancholy. So it came to pass when she heard that they had turned him over to Nara and he had been executed there. She put off all her finery, clothes herself in the deepest black, gave her life to serious pious practice at Zenkoji in Shinano and prayed the only oh, only that the next life bring him rebirth in paradise and to the end she too they say achieved birth in pure land uh, spoiler the woman I forgot to the woman noble from earlier also after they found she found out that this guy died renounced the world and became a monk and prayed for him so again there's this very there's a heroic strain of like was this such a good guy that two different women renounced their lives to pray for him one was actually his longtime lover one was just a woman he played music with once and she gave him a bath right you're definitely seeing both power of character and kind of the effect that like virtuous people have on other people so he's killed by the way nada cuts his head off so uh here we go so we get a little interesting interlude with some of the interesting characters now we get to the end and it's a big naval battle that's why we have all these naval pictures book 11 this is the end so if you want to know how it ends you should read it so i'm going to spoil it so okay now we're in the inland sea of japan the heike are on the run and we start to get some of the final fights uh, so there's some very famous scenes here. So, uh, did I take a picture of this? I sure hope I did. Let us see. Don't tell me I didn't take this picture. Oh man, now I gotta find my other picture of it. Hold on. I didn't even have it on this slide. It must be an older slide. Hold on, I'm gonna show you guys this picture because I like it so much. Uh, 13... 12? No, I think it's 13. Oh, that's not it. And that's not it. It's not that one. It's not that one. It's not that one. I can't find it. Oh, it's in your book. I'll have to tell you the page number. Oh, uh, if you look at 596, this is the Nasu no Yochi. And this is one of the sung ones. But I didn't bring it today. Uh, this is where he basically, uh, they're, they're before the battle, they're actually kind of like playing. What I mean is the Heike are in the ocean. The Genji are in the ocean and the land. And the, the Heike get a hot lady. I think she's 20. And they get her to hold up on a, on a stick, a fan, right? Like a fan to wave yourself. And they challenge them, the, the Genji to shoot at it. And they get a really good archer, and they shoot it, and it's so impressive. I think it's like a oh, it's a, like a water shot that's almost impossible. Um, both sides start cheering, and then the same archer shoots one of the Heike guys in the boats and ends the cheering. Aw. But we get this really interesting kind of pre-battle, pre-last battle demonstration of a little bit of gamery and camaraderie that ends with people dying, of course. Um, all right, next one. Okay. Now we get the dropped bow. This is the battle, the pre-battle. Um, so we start getting Yoshitsune, one of the sons of the, uh, the Genji, 
fighting. Um, this one is where you just start to get skirmishes between the guys on the on the horses, the Genji guys on the horses, and the guys in the water. And uh, basically, the general almost loses his bow. And they ask, like, why do you go back for it? Where's this? Um, oh, you should see that he makes a joke here. He swims out and they almost capture him and get his bow and he fights for his bow. And they ask him, why the heck did you risk it? Fighting your boat. They're basically swimming with their horses amongst the boats and fighting, but they're trying to capture it. You'll see soon. He says basically, I didn't leave it because I was using such a weak bow that leaving it would be embarrassing and hurt morale. And everybody's like, wow, what a wise man. <laughs> because there's different, if you haven't noticed yet, they talk about like lengths and strength of bow. The, the harder your bow is to pull, right, the more force you get. But if you can't do it all day, you should pick a weaker bow. So he's just admitting to not being that strong, but he's strategic. Interesting character for one of the Genji. Alright, now we start getting the fighting. <laughs> this one's just interesting because you get an interesting uh, capture. You ca 19 guys capture 3,000. But, uh, fun one. Now, cockfights in the Battle of Danoda. So Danoda is the big naval battle that this is, by the way, if you're curious. So we now get this final battle. Um, and actually, it's 3,000 versus 1,000 ships. It, so the Heike only have 1,000, uh, th but they do have, like, giant Chinese warships. So they seem to be doing well. Um, what happens, though? <sighs> Defections, in the end cost the Heike the fight. They more and more of their own guys defect, and they start to lose. Um, then we get this inter- what's the cockfight? Basically one of the guys who defects, the way he decides what side to join is he goes to a shrine, and like the shrine gives him his answer, and he doesn't like it. So he gets red and white cocks to fight, and all the red cocks lose, and all the white fights cocks win, and white's the color of the Genji. So he decides, oh, I'll defect. So and down the is where this battle happens. Now, uh, we get we get some interesting long-distance duels here, too, where the people on the land and the people on the boat start dueling each other with arrows. Uh, just, it shows kind of interesting character. And then, how do they know they're going to win? Well, Yoshitsune basically has a white banner flutter down from a cloud with a Buddha in it. It's like, ah, we're going to win now. Yay! So the, the, the final fight starts to happen. Um... And the, the tide turns towards the Genji. And all the omens turn against the uh, Heike, and it's not good. And we get the final sad conclusion, which is the drowning of Emperor Antoku. So this boy emperor, if you remember, he was two when he became emperor. Very tragic. So as the Heike are losing, we then have to start to deal with what happens to the emperor. Well, we get this final scene picture from our book here. A bunch of different interactions. But I'm going to read part of this, because it is very tragic. And then, they basically, want some of the warriors are running away, and they run to the Imperial Barge, and so on 610, and the ladies ask, how's the battle going, going Lo to Tomomori? He's one of the kids for the Heike. He says, ladies, while laughing, you, and he said, answered, roaring with laughter, you will soon meet some rare gallants from the east. They wailed, how can you joke at a time like this? And for some time, Lady Ni, nee, who is the grandmother of the emperor, she is one of the, she's uh, Kilmore's wife, had expected what she now saw. She threw her two gray nun's robes over her head, lifted her beaten silk trouser skirts, clasped the sacred drool at her side, thrust the treasure sword into her sash, lifted the emperor in her arms. I may be a woman, she said, but I will not let the enemy take me. No, your majesty, I shall accompany you. All those loyal to our sovereign, follow me. She stepped to the side of the boat. His majesty, in his eighth year, was thoroughly grown up for his age, and his beauty shone around him. His rich black hair hung below the waist. Where are you taking me, grandmother? he asked. Wonder in his eyes. You still do not know, your majesty? Your virtuous karma from past lives made you sovereign over the realm, but now the influence of some evil has brought your grandeur to an end. 
First, your majesty, if you please. Face east. And say goodbye to the grand Issei Shrine. Then, trusting Amida to welcome you into his western paradise, face west and call his name. This land of ours, a few millet grains scattered in remote seas, is not a nice place. I am taking you now to a much happier one, the pure land of bliss. So she addressed him weeping, robed in dove gray, his hair in side loops, like any boy's, cheeks streaming with tears. He pressed his dear little hands together, prostrated himself towards the east, and bade well farewell to the Issei Shrine, then turned west, calling the name. And Lady Ni nee said, her arms around him, down there far beneath the waves. Another capital awaits us, and plunged into the fathomless deep, alas, the spring winds of transience, in one brief instant, sweep away the beauty of this lovely blossom, the billows of the heartless fate, swallowed his sovereign majesty. And there we go. So, a sad ending, and if you keep reading, ten... Eleven and twelve, you get the rest of the people who try to jump ship. <clears throat> so, the, by the way, of the pictures, here's the emperor going off. Uh, here's Morinori trying to kill himself. He's the leader of the army. Uh, they catch him, by the way, and a couple of the other guys try to get away. But the emperor and the empress, and by the way, with half the imperial regalia, jump into the ocean, and it ends. And he's a cute little kid, and so... There you go. <laughs> I need a sip of water. And that's the end of the Heike's aspirations for the throne. Now, se several of them, if you look at this picture, actually do get captured. And several die well, but the Genji win, capture a bunch of them, and we, there's entered into a new age. So, this chapter 11 is definitely a conclusion, especially if you read the whole book. I'd recommend it. I mean, I reread it today, and it still hits me. It's a good ending. Especially if you get engaged with the characters and read the whole book. Just a poor little kid. And, by the way, Emperor Antoku is the one who's related to the Heike. So, he also goes out. And, apparently, the, his mom, who, if you're curious, she's the one who gets her own little book at the end. If you look uh, past book 12... I'm looking now. I always get her name wrong, too, so I don't want to mess it up. Here we go. Her name is Kenrimonin. Kenrimonin. And she becomes a nun after this. And she actually tries to kill herself, too, with the Imperial Mirror. There's the mirror and the jewel and the sword. And the, the grandma jumps in the water with the sword and the jewel. And then the, the, the mom tries to jump in with the, the, the mirror... And they actually shoot her to the deck by accident, and she can't kill herself. So they capture her, she becomes a nun, and actually she eventually goes to paradise. And this this end of the book, we skipped it, but it's a great little story. It's only like 20 pages, where she goes to paradise, and there's a nice graphic at the end, on 706 and 707, where she basically makes it. Which, a uh, happy Buddhist ending, still sad for this little prince guy. And apparently they lose the jewel, or they claim to have reclaimed it. I don't know how you got the... They found the sword, I don't know how you find the jewel from the bottom of the ocean, but, you know... So yeah, the Japanese Imperial Regalia. So this is the end of the story. And here's the really awesome picture of the battle. Uh, questions, problems. If there isn't, we'll spend about 15 minutes talking about methodology a little bit, then we'll be free. But I just want to ask if anybody has any questions. And if you feel like you're missing details, of course you are. I had to skip it like half the book. I went fast. So I recommend poking around it especially for characters that you seem to think are interesting or want to analyze. I think there's even... Yes. If you look in the front of your books, folks, in the principal figures in the tale, it actually tells you where they appear at the end of their entry, so you can go, like, reread the parts where certain famous characters are. So it kind of gives you, like, a cheat sheet, almost, to figure out where they are and kind of learn more about their character. Uh, but any questions? Tail random questions, questions specific questions. Hmm. Oh, and by the way, Antoku's death would also be considered a good death. 
somebody asked me the earlier question. But that would be considered an honorable death, especially for an eight-year-old. In this setting. It's not a happy death for me, but, you know, I guess you could say it's emotionally satisfying. Now we'll see how long the stream lag is. Hmm. Ah, 15 seconds. That's not so bad. All right, I do not see any questions popping up, uh, which is fine. Um, now we're going to do a little bit of methodology, and then we'll go back to Discord and you guys can ask me questions. So, all right, um, methodology. Here we go. All right, so now we're going to spend a little bit on analytics. Uh, timing's weird, because that was just a really emotional story. If you didn't read it, you have no idea what it's not emotional. If you read it, it still might not even hit you. Let's just say I've read just enough Japanese stuff for the Japanese aesthetic definitely hits me in the feels. I can't even help it at this point. I've just studied too much of this stuff. Alright, let's fix that, because you guys can even see me fixing it. What magic! I love the... Okay, teaching online's not all bad. Alright, here we go. Fantastic. Alright! So, I don't see any questions yet, so let's keep going. Alright, so uh, kind of a discussion. Normally, if this was in class, I'd let you guys discuss. But let me, let me drop questions on you now that I'm not going to give you all the answers to it, but they're good. We'll talk about it a little bit after, but also they're good to think about with your paper. So kind of the Buddhist methodology of history, we get a C in this book. If you didn't read it, I mentioned some of it, but I skip over some of it too. Now this book is interesting in that way because there's not actually a work, a non-fiction work of, like, how do Buddhists conceive history? This might, one reason that makes this book really interesting, it's not just a Japanese book, but it's kind of how do Mahayana Buddhists look at, look at historiography. How does how would they write a history book? So Buddhism the Heike is definitely one of the themes you can address in your paper. Oh, let's get my laser pointer back. Here we go. So some questions you can ask uh, when you're writing or when you're thinking about it, right? What's considered a good action? And remember, just because of the 21st century and a lot of people you know or maybe even you are total subjectivists and they say stupid things like, what is good? What is bad? Dumbest thing I've ever heard. Dumbest thing I've ever heard. Basically, all of humanity has agreed good and bad is for a long time, within within bounds. Good means what it's always meant, right? What is a morally upright thing to do in this Buddhist sense? So think about it, right? Which stories aren't just like a good warrior ending, but which ones are a good Buddhist ending, right? Because in this story, there's kind of like a triple action, right? There's like what's honorable, which is like almost like pre-Bushido, right? Because we don't have the Japanese warrior code codified yet, but you have that early aspects of it. So what's considered honorable from a Japanese perspective? What's considered good from a Confucian perspective? But most importantly, there's much more directly Buddhism here. What's a good Buddhist action? I'll give you a spoiler, right? Those two women we talked about who gave up their life of stuff, and this is important too, they're young and good-looking and successful women. They give up their life of stuff to pray for their own and other people's souls. That is a happy Buddhist ending, to give you one of the many good actions. That is a good one. Alright, another one. Uh, in this one too, think about political versus personal. Because interestingly enough, this story does have Buddhist political commentary. And again, what's an easy example? Pretty much any burning down of a temple, right? But think about any time they refer to the Buddha way, the degradation of the Buddha way. What does that mean? for, a, like, politically, not just personally. Because on the personal, right, it'd be personal devotion to the Buddha, makes sense. But what is the political Buddhist way? That's my challenge to you, something to think about for your paper. Uh, also think about what are bad actions. I mean, obvious ones are obvious, right? But killing, right? Especially unjust killing, that would be an easy one. But give me examples, right? Um, other ones. Redemptive actions. What kind of, like, comeback is there? Again, we read one today, right? Literally the guy who burnt Nara managed to get, or at least the option of forgiveness from the monk he was talking to. So, but what are the redemption, what are the, rede the redemptive actions? Where do we get some comeback? And then, is it a Buddhist happy ending? I'm not going to answer this for you, but like, this is the kind of the Buddhist meta question. Overall, is this a happy, and when I say happy, don't just think, like, do I feel good emotions? Think about happy ending as in eudaimonia, right? Good living. So using the Greek definition of happiness, is this, would this be a good Buddhist ending? 
that, I'll let you sit on that, but for your paper's sake, and just for the intellectual exercise, is the Heike losing a good Buddhist ending? And this is something you can address in your paper. It's both kind of like a meta question, but also it's a it's an interesting question in general, right? How could we analyze this ending of the defeat of the Heike and lots of people dying and, let's be honest, even killing themselves? How is this ending, considering the first half of the book we spent a lot of detail on, what can we learn from something to think of like karma and good and bad? So yes, uh, somebody asks, is it considered a more philosophical meta question? Yes. So these ones here, the first ones where I said Buddhism and the Heike, these are more the basic philosophy, right? They're moral philosophy, which is interesting. But this one would be the metaphysics question, right? Just like the questions I listed on all the previous ones, on the quote we got from uh, classical literary criticism, right? This is like the this is the the Buddhist version of one of those questions. And by the way, there's a lot more of these questions you could kind of scope or make. But this is one I'm proposing to you as a hypothetical. But yeah, this would be a more meta-style question, for sure. All right. And uh, by the way, is a Buddhist monk. See, he even has the prayer beads. Yeah. And just traditional Japanese clothes. Because they're not fancy, he might be a monk. And how do you know he's a monk? Shaved palate. His head is shaved. All right, any Buddhist questions before we jump in? And again, you can save up your questions. We are we should be about, let's see, it's 7.18. I'll bet money we're a little bit early. What I mean is, we, yeah, probably 10 more minutes, we're done. So that would give us at least 20 minutes for questions. So if you have personal questions you want to ask me on the Discord, totally good. That's great, too. And there's somebody typed. Nope, nobody typed, just Jeffrey. All right, let's keep going. Okay, now Mencius, a little bit of late recap reca recapitulation. But actually Mencius fits in well right here. I actually like talking about him here. So Mencius and Confucius, as we mentioned before, met, right, the Chinese are one of our methodologies. Mencius doesn't necessarily disprove Confucius. And he doesn't argue as much as, say, Plato and Aristotle do. Instead, I would say he builds. Now what does he build? Uh, a couple things. First, it, as a broad category, I would say he tends to have more metaphysics and analysis than Confucius. Why? Well, if you didn't read it yet, he is much more long form. If you just flip through your Mencius book, it just the examples are so much bigger. He just gives a lot more ethical and logical detail. Now, how does he do it? Well, a great place to look for this, if you've never learned about it, and actually in my lower division class I teach this, uh, in the appendixes of this version of the book, the Penguin Classics, they're all articles by D.C. Lau. And uh, the appendix five is on Mencius's use of the method of analogy and argument. Now, why is this interesting? Because from Mencius, basically, analogy continues to be used in all East Asian logic. Um, somebody asked, did they split into Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism back then? doesn't matter. The split started literally as soon as Buddhism hit China. So, Ma Theravada Buddhism was originally the only kind of Buddhism. And then, once it hit China, Mahayana Buddhism became a thing. And Mahayana Buddhism, as far as I can tell, was basically invented in the Chinese context. And if it wasn't invented by them, it's where it exploded. So it, apply it appealed, so all the grace in the book, right, where you can just pray the name of the Buddha and you're saved, that is 100% Mahayana, 0% Theravada. So, for the Theravadans, you have to just grind through the cycle until you eventually become a monk. Mahayanans, a warrior can make it today. So, Mahayana and that kind of flexibility is very much more a... It's very much more a um, Mahayanan trait. And very much more, I mean, exclusively Mahayanan. So, yeah, all the Buddhism in this book is Mahayana. There is no Theravada in this book. Just, it did never make it to Japan, and if it did, it just wasn't as important. That's a good question, though. All right. Now, when I'm saying analogy and argument, I'm going to give you one of these examples, and then uh, you can go look it up later. Now, the reason he adds this to the book is sometimes traditional Chinese logic can be considered uh, unfair by, like, very rigorous Western standards, but uh, it's not actually. Now, um, I'll point out before I give you these examples, 
mentions his big fight that he adds to Confucius. He basically argues that there's goodness inherent in all men. Interesting. Now, why does this matter for our sakes? One of the questions in the Buddhist questions in this book is like, what is human goodness? Do our humans good or bad? How do we judge it? Uh, but he gives some analogies here, which I'll read to you really quick. Um, actually, I'll, I'll give you one example, the short one. This is on 201 if you have your Mencius book. Uh, Kao Tzu said, Human nature is like a willow. Yi is like cups. Yi is, by the way, one of the responsibilities. Let me find the footnote. Man, I already... Yeah, here we go. Yi is uh, morality, or benevolence, basically. So, I'll read it one more time. So, human nature is like the willow, ye is like cups, benevolence. To make morality out of human nature is like making cups out of the willow. Mencius said, how can you make cups by following the nature of the willow? Or must you do violence to the willow before you can make it into cups? If the latter is the cause, you must then also do violence to a man before you can make him moral? It is these words of yours that will lead men in this world into bringing disaster upon morality. So again, considering righteousness in men to cups and trees, right? Making wood cups. What's the point of the logic here? This is how Mencius loves to argue, but there's a good point here. Do you use violence on men to make them moral, or do you encourage them from like a natural way, right? Because the following the nature of the willow. So do you have to follow the nature of the thing, or can you just force morality onto a thing? That's a good question. Obviously, Mencius is a fan of using natural morality, right? And like encouraging what's naturally there, not forcing it. The other guy is definitely a constructivist. So now there's other good, his famous examples. These two aren't arguments, but there's two favorite. Uh, if you've ever taken my lower division class, you've already heard these, but they're good to have reference to. And I'll give you the page numbers too, because I just saved these. Let me see. Okay, Well Parable is on 38, if you have your Mencius. If you have a different version of Mencius, this is uh, Book 2, Part A, number 6. So I'll give you this, and then we'll, 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 I'll just kind of explain how you can use this as an analytical tool, and we'll be free. Here we go, okay. So number 6, Mencius said, quote, No man is devoid of a heart, sensitive to the suffering of others. Such a sensitive heart was possessed by former kings and manifest itself in the compassionate government. With such a sensitive heart behind compassionate government, it was easy to rule the empire as rolling it up in your palm. My reason for saying that no man is devoid of heart, sensitive to the suffering of others, is this. Suppose a man were, all of a sudden, to see a young child on the verge of falling into a well. He would certainly be moved to compassion, not because he wanted to get in the good grace of the parents, nor because he wished to win the praise of his fellow villagers, or friends, nor yet because he disliked the cry of a child. From this it can be seen that whoever is devoid of the heart of compassion is not human. Whoever is devoid of the heart of shame is not human. Whoever is devoid of the heart of courtesy and modesty is not human. And whoever is devoid of the heart of right and wrong is not human. The heart of compassion is the germ of benevolence, the heart of shame of dutifulness, the heart of courtesy and modesty of observance of the rights, the heart of right and wrong, of wisdom. Man has those four germs just as he had four limbs. For a man possessing four germs to deny his own potentialities is to, form, is to cripple himself. For him to deny the potentialities of his prince, for him is to cripple his prince. If a man is able to develop all these four germs that he possesses, it will be like a fire starting up or a spring coming through. When these are fully developed, he can tend the whole realm within the four seas. But if he fails to develop them, he will not be able to even serve his parents. So, if you've never heard the well parable before, I recommend digging around, reminding you, page 38. Um, but what's the point? Men just believe that all humans have that kind of grain of morality. And if we ever saw a kid about to die, you'd at least have the urge to, you'd at least certainly be moved to compassion, even if you didn't act. Right? There's like this granularity of goodness in all people. So he's kind of adding a human nature or psychology argument to Confucius's argument. Because Confucius never talked about this. Mencius had different problems. And this is a quite famous parable. 
if you're arguing for or against, you know, are humans inherently good? And then what causes them to be good or bad? And a lot of, like, say you were going to analyze our story, right? It'd be like, why were the Genji bad? Are they inherent, or the Heike? Why were the Heike bad? Are they inherently bad? Or is it like, were they trained badly? And you can you use that to analyze them? Sure, because as we saw today, right? Not every character is equally atrocious. There are some morally interesting people, or at least cultured people. Great. All right. The next one, this one's also super famous, and if you didn't read the book, I'll tell you where it is, because you should read it. It's one of his most famous. This is a book six, part A, number eight. And this is also Mencius, just for those of you who are curious. And I'm going to read this one too, and then we'll talk about it a little bit, and it will be free. All right. Mencius said, There was a time when trees were luxuriant on the Ox Mountain, but it was on the outskirts of a great metropolis. The trees are constantly lopped by axes. Is it any wonder they are no longer fine? With the respite they get in the day and the night, and the moistening by the rain and the dew, there is certainly no lack of new shoots coming out. But then the cattle and sheep come and graze on the mountain. That is why it is bald as it is. People, seeing only its baldness, tend to think it never had any trees. But can this possibly be the nature of a mountain? Can what is in a man be completely lacking in moral inclinations? A man letting go of his true heart is like the case of the trees and the axes. When the trees are lopped day after day, is it any wonder that they can no longer, are no longer fine? If, in spite of the respite the man gets in the day and in the night, and of the effect of the morning air on him, scarcely any of his likes or dislikes will resemble those of other men. It is because he does, in the course of the day, once again dissipate what he has gained. If this dissipation happens repeatedly, then the influence of the air of the night will no longer be able to preserve what was originally in him. And when that happens, the man is not far removed from an animal. Others, seeing this resemblance to an animal, will be led to think that he never had any native endowment. But can that be what a man is genuinely like? Hence... Given the right nourishment, there is nothing that will not grow, and deprived of it, there is nothing that will not wither away. Confucius said, hold on to it, and it will remain, let it go, and it will disappear. One never knows the time it comes or goes, neither does he know the direction. It is perhaps to the heart that this refers. And those are probably the two most famous Mencius quotes. And again, the second one, they're both dealing with human nature and goodness. And the second one is just making an allegorical, right? an analogy to a mountain and the like, kind of like the, the, the endowment, natural moral endowment of people. And it's like negative influences can make it worse, but that doesn't mean it's not there. We just, because we don't see it means we may, you know, it seems like it's not there, but perhaps if our inputs were different, we would, you know, our natural endowment could come out. And again, because we're analyzing good and bad characters and stories, and we're, we're trying to understand the meta weight, right? The metaphysical, does this book make good people? Right? The question then has to be, if from a Mencius perspective, what makes good people? And you can even compare, say, Mencius to someone like Aristotle, or Plato especially. Plato is a much more uh, tools-based guy, right? Like, ah, I think top-down rules make the best people. Like, good rules, but that's what makes the best people. Mencius might not be necessarily that strong, right? He's, he's a little more positive i'd almost say so okay these are kind of where i want to get you guys to in the right mindset to write your paper and add a little bit to it and i know it's a little late to recapitulate mentions but hopefully you still have your book knocking around i mean the bookstore's not even open so you can't even resell it all right so it's 7 30 right now um i'm gonna give it 30 seconds if you have questions for the stream but if you don't then i'll close this down and answer questions in the discord and then we'll go home all right it sounds like my kid's out of the bath, and I'm sure he wants me to put him to bed. So, I'll answer your questions, then do that. We will give it a second. Ah, we only lost two people. Not so bad. And, let's see. Okay, I don't see any questions popping up that quick. So, I'm going to end it here. Um, if you're a student, please start your paper. Uh, the prompt is up on Beachboard, and you can ask me questions through Discord if you're a random community person or a Twitch watcher. Thanks for watching, or if you're watching the replay on YouTube later, you know, enjoy. Uh, read Tale of Heike. It's probably top ten greatest books ever written in the world. 
and for definitely top two in the Japanese tradition. Um, yeah, great. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you all next class where we're doing the Ramayana. We're getting an Indian classics. So have a beautiful day. I'll see you all soon. Goodbye.